Hey, welcome back. If you've been following along, you should have a dragon now that's able to jump over these stumps. We should have stumps that go to the left and then pop back to the right whenever they get far enough to the left. And it's time for us to, well, expand on this and make it a little bit more interesting. We're going to use the variety of stump visuals that we have here and a concept called prefabs. Now this is a core concept in Unity. You'll see it all throughout your game development career. As you're working in Unity, you'll see prefabs for pretty much everything. We use them to share or reuse data. So what we'll do is we'll create an object, we'll turn it into that prefab, and then we'll reuse that object so that we don't have to recreate it a bunch of times. I'm gonna go through this process and show you and just kind of follow along. So the first thing I wanna do is create an empty game object. I'm gonna use this as the kind of parent to my other game objects. Now we haven't looked at parenting, so let's see how this would work. What I'm gonna do is select the stumps zero here, which is just this one that's off to the side. I'm gonna right click and hit create empty. And notice that it created an empty game object. It's just named a game object. It doesn't have any components on it other than the transform. And the local position is zero, zero, and zero because it's centered right at the center of the parent object, which is the stump. So if I move it to the right of the stump, the X value is gonna go up. If I move it to the left of the stump, the X value goes down. And then watch the Y goes up and down as well. Now I want this to be centered right where the thing is. So I'm gonna right click on transform and just hit reset to clear that back out. Now I'm gonna do the tricky part. So I'm gonna take this game object, click on it and drag it down here into this white area so that it's no longer a child of the stump, but it's still in the same position. This is just a trick that I do to speed up positioning. Uh, you can do it a different way, but it's just kind of the way that I like to do it because it's nice and fast. So we've got this game object here, and I'm going to click on it and rename it. You can also hit F2 to rename, and I'm just going to call this tree. Now I'm going to take stump zero here, and I'm going to drag it down to be a child of that tree. So now as I grab this tree, here, select the tree, and move the tree around, you see that the stump moves with the tree. In fact, I could even take stumps zero here and drag that down to be a child of the tree as well. Just drop it right on top of the tree. And then if I click the tree and drag it, you'll see that the two trees move left and right. Kind of cool, not exactly what we want to do, but I did want to show that you can move these two children together. So what we're going to do now is take this stump zero, and I'm just going to delete it. That's the second one here, the number one. I just want the one that's centered at zero, zero of the tree. So select the tree, then select the stump, stump position and everything should be zeroed out. Again, if it's not, just hit reset. Now for this to work, we need to make a little change. We need to select the stump zero and we need to take this move left script and move it to the tree. Luckily, I can just click and drag and drop it right on there. And if I select the tree, you'll see that the script has moved. And if I go back to the stumps, you see that it's actually moved off. It actually allows us to just drag and drop them. Now I did make a mistake though, and I did that while I was in play mode with it paused. So I'm gonna stop playing and watch the script reappear on my stump and then drag it back onto the tree one more time. There we go, now it's back on the tree. We've got move left there and the stump no longer has it. And I should be able to play and bounce and hit into that tree. Let's see. So I jump, 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 I hit the tree and I still die. So everything is still working. What's the benefit here? Well. Let's find out. It's time to add another stump. So we've got our tree here. We've got stump zero. Let's take stump one. Just hold, it, drag right on top of the word tree. And now we've got a stumps one. I'm gonna take stumps two, do the same, drop it right on top of the tree. Don't worry that they're all stacking up in the middle. We'll move them in a second. We'll do the same with stumps three. Now I'm gonna select all three of these children. I've got the last one clicked on and hold shift and click on the first one here. So I've got one through three. And I'm going to right click on transform and just reset them. And I didn't have to do that to number zero because it was already in that position. Now let's go in and just uncheck these. So I've got one through three selected and we can just turn off those visuals or turn them back on. But what we need to do is add a collider first. So we're going to hit add component again with all three of these selected. We're going to go into the 2D section, physics 2D, and we're going to look for the polygon collider again. There we go, so we've got a polygon collider added to all of these. Now let's select them individually. Let's take a quick peek. And notice how we don't see the collider. If we expand out this polygon collider, it now shows up. So now we can see the collider for each one of these is a little bit different and it matches to the sprite that we have there. So 
why are we doing this? What's the point? Well, we're going to make this actually randomly change out which stump to show, move it across, and then when it resets, it'll pick another stump. And we're going to do that in our move left script. So I'm going to open up my move left script, get this right back in position. And then when we do the reset, instead of just moving the position, we're also going to randomly select a child to show. Now to do that, we need to expand this out a little bit. Currently on line 12, we check if the transforms position x value is less than negative 15. And we run the single line of code on line 13 to move the position. We add vector 3 with a 30 on the x to move it 30 units to the right on the x axis. So we want to do more. We need to actually add in some squiggly braces. What we're going to do is go to the end of line 12. And I'll hit enter. Then I'll add in a squiggly brace, which is shift and the key just to the right of P. Now, since we're in a code editor, it's assuming that I want to just start typing inside these braces, and it's automatically added that closing curly brace there. So what I'm going to do instead is hit the delete key, which is just above or just below insert. It's one of the six special keys there. And then I'm going to go down to the end of line 14, hit enter two times, and re-add that closing brace, which is just shift and the key two to the right of the letter P. Now, I want to do something a little bit different. So once we move, we're going to switch to a randomly selected sprite. We're going to pick one of them and just enable it. So I'm going to make a new method. I'm going to call it show random sprite. Just like that. I just type out the words, and then I hit shift 9 to add my parentheses, and I go to the end and I hit a semicolon. Now, you see we've got a nice squiggly underlined error saying, hey, show random sprite doesn't exist. You might think, hey, does this, this is like a thing in Unity to show random sprite. It's definitely not. It's a method that we're going to create. And the way that I do it is by typing these out. And then I like to hit control period with the show random sprite selected. Make sure your cursor's on it. And then hit generate method. And what that does is create a new method for me that will do whatever I tell it to do. Right now it just throws an exception, which means it's gonna show an error in the log, be slow and cause problems. Not what we wanna do. That's just the default message or the default behavior there, just to remind you, hey, you created this method, you forgot to actually do something with it. So I delete that out, and instead I want to pick a random sprite and show it. So to do that, first we need to pick a random number. Let's go back into Unity. If we look here, we have four stumps. I want to pick a random number between 0, which is the first one. Luckily, they're indexed exactly how we index them in code, and 3. And then we'll show whichever one we found or picked between 0 and 3. So to do that, we call, well, first we need to pick a variable to assign our number to. So I'll say integer, or int. Um, let's call this index, because it's going to be our child index to show, equals unity engine dot random dot range and not now don't pick random range pick range and then use shift nine for the open parentheses and we need to give it a minimum and a maximum and if you look here you'll notice that it's got a float or if i hit the down arrow or click the little thing here i also have the option for an int and we're going to use an int and it's going to know that by default because we're just not going to put any decimal points so i'll put zero comma three and a semicolon now we'll pick a random number between 0 and 3. The next thing we want to do is show that child. So we have a couple options here. Let's go back into Unity one more time. To get our children, we actually look at the transform component, and it has a method on it called get children or get child. child it has a child counter, a whole bunch of other things. So we're going to use this transform to find out what all of the child transforms are. We'll go back into the code. And what we want to do now is loop over all of the children. But first, we want to get the number of children. So we're going to say int child count equals transform dot child count. And we're just saving that off. We don't necessarily need to save this off, but I like to save it off here in a variable to make it very explicit what we're doing. Now we're going to add in another line, and we're going to use a special word called for. This is going to allow us to loop over children and do something for each one of the children. And I'll explain this as we go along, but start off with just a lowercase word for, and then an open parentheses. And then we need to give it a type, which is going to be int, because we're going to do it four times. We're essentially going to do this loop and run this code four times, or however many the child count is. Right now, that's four. We know it, but we're getting it anyway, so that we can adjust it later if we want to. 
So we'll say int i, which is very common in a for loop. If you see a loop or the word for, and you see int, it's almost always gonna be i or j or k. Sometimes it's a more descriptive name. A lot of the time the default though is just gonna be i. So we'll say int i equals zero. Then we do a semicolon i less than child count, semicolon i plus plus. And then we add in the squiggly braces on two new lines, and then we'll start talking about what this actually means. So this is the for loop. This is to loop over things or loop a certain number of times. We're declaring an integer named i and setting the default value to zero. We're going to run the code that's in these squiggly braces as long as the value of i is less than the child count. So right now child counts four, so we'll run through and it'll hit four zero, it'll go through, it'll run this code once for i equaling one, once for it equaling two, and once for it equaling three. Now the reason that it increments is right here. At the After the last semicolon, we have i plus plus. So this means that start off with i equals zero, keep going until i, this variable that we're incrementing is less than our child count, which again is four right now. And every time after you do it, increment i by one by using the plus plus. Plus plus just adds one to a number. So as long as we have a number, doing plus plus after it adds one, just because it's a very common operation that we need to do. So we're looping over it and we're gonna run all of the code between 26 and 28 four times. The code that we wanna actually call here is gonna be transform.getChild and then we open parentheses and give it i. And then at the end, put a semicolon. So this is going to get the child transform. So we're getting it, but we're not really assigning it or doing anything with it. So we're not gonna get an error, but we're just kind of getting the child and doing nothing to it. So we have a couple options. What I'm gonna do is assign it to something so that it's really very explicit what we're doing. So we'll say transform child equals transform.getChild. So this is going to be the child transform object or these little sprites. It's gonna be the first one, the second one, third one, and then the fourth one. So what do we wanna to do to that? Well, I'll say child.gameObject.setActive. And then we want to either turn it to be active or not active based on if the index that we've selected matches i. So we have a couple ways we can do this. We can just do index double equals i and put a semicolon at the end. And what that'll do is evaluate to being true if it's the correct one or the selected one and it'll be false for all the other ones and turn them off. We can also, let's just cut this out real quick, say bool should show equals and then I can put index double equals i and then copy should show and put that in as a variable as well. Um, Generally, I probably wouldn't necessarily create the variable for it, but when we're really trying to be explicit and show what our code is doing, it's good to just put in some well-named variables to make it really obvious. So that's it. Now we've got code that will loop through our children and it will activate one of them that is randomly selected and it's going to deactivate the rest because set active takes a true or a false. So if it's false, it's gonna turn them all off. If it's true, it'll turn that one on. Let's try it out. Let's hit play. And remember, it doesn't happen until our stump gets all the way to the end. So let's just watch our stumps go to the end and look in the scene hierarchy and see what you see. Look at that, stump one is now visible. What do we get next? Stump zero is visible and so on. So it's randomly selecting a stump. Now we might wanna pick one at the beginning as well. So perhaps we're not happy with the fact that we have all four stumps and then you know, it cleans up afterwards, so let, let's do that too. And we can do that by adding in another special method. So I'm gonna go right down here to the end of show random sprite, right after line 32, right before the last squiggly brace. If you have extra stuff, just make sure it's before this last squiggly brace. We'll add in a new line, and we're gonna say on enable. I just type O-N-E-N, -E and it kind of auto-completes, and I'll hit enter. Just let it fill out the method for me. And in here, I just wanna call again my show random sprite. So I'll say show random sprite, and if I hit enter, it'll auto-complete. Again, shift nine for the open parentheses, then go to the end and semicolon to close it. That's it, so now if I go back in and hit play one more time, my tree, let's see it, let's see it in action. It should, yep, pick a random stump. 
Pretty cool, right? So we have one more step that I want to dive into before we go on to the next part, and that is turning this tree into a prefab. So we're going to go to the Assets folder, and then we'll right-click on this empty folder, and we're going to create another empty folder called Prefabs. So I've named it with, again, if you misnamed it, just hit F2 to go back into rename mode, and then double-click to go into that folder. Here comes the fun part and the, the really hard part of making a prefab. We take the tree from the scene view here, the scene hierarchy, click it and drag, drop it down into prefabs, and we're done. We now have a prefab of a tree that we can reuse in different levels or with, throughout our level or even spawn by code. And notice that it changed here because this is kind of the important part. We got the little blue mark there. That means that this is now a prefab. It also means that any change that we do to this one here will apply to that. So if I change this speed to, I don't know, six, and go select my tree, you'll see that the speed on the tree is now six. Now there are ways to customize individual instances of prefabs. We'll talk about that more as we go through things. But I really wanted you to be able to see that we can now reuse this tree. So I'm gonna take this tree and just drop it out here. And drop out a couple more of them. Zoom out. And I think I'll drop out like five or six of them. And then let's hit play and watch our game in action. We're gonna have all different stumps there. They're all going at that same speed of six. It's very, very easy because we still haven't added much in the line of difficulty, but that's coming next. So get this part working. And then when you're ready, what we're gonna do is put in some monsters, make them fly, make prefabs out of them, and then start shooting at them. Again, if you like this stuff, don't forget to like, subscribe, share, let everybody know and uh, drop a comment below so that I know. And uh, thanks again.